And in the beginning, I was asked when I came in to do something that allows you to, to give you that very strict, like, in March, Raffaele will have 95% of his time taken up. And over time, we just realized that this was not only taxing my sanity to have to do math 20 to six hours a day every day, um, but math that was ostensibly not based in reality because in reality, people don't work in percentages. Um, things take longer or take less time than, than usually any, any estimate of a percentage that you put into a grant is really going to end up being in reality. As a broader philosophy, that, and some of this might seem obvious to some of you, but anytime something like this seems obvious, just know that when you go into an institution, project management is something that really does not come natural to a lot of people that you will work with. So you will think it's really obvious to, to do things like have online collaborative documents that you work with or have uh, a central location where all files, files are stored. Other people just kind of want to do things as they go and keep them in their heads, it happens. Um, so you might have to be an advocate for sort of like pushing some of this stuff on people. And in the end, it's always worth it because I've had, I have had scenarios where you know, I kind of like fold to the group sort of going, oh, I don't want to keep a form tracking that and then later, someone gets sued, this actually happened at Discovery because something wasn't tracked properly. Um, it got to the editor at Discovery and they put in the wrong caption for the wrong hot air balloon company and they came back and I said, I didn't say it, but I was thinking it like, I wanted to come up with a form tracking lower thirds and no one wanted to do it. So anyway, anytime you wanna do something more organizationally and someone like rolls their eyes, just know you're right. Um, okay. And this will cover various levels of complexity and just know that not all these tools are applicable to all of your situations. These are scalable. Sometimes you're going to need something more a solution that is more complex and sometimes you're going to need something very simple. So I just want to define a project. Um, this is actually pulled from uh, my former boss, Jen, Giuli Jen Giuliano, who used to present project management of digital humanities projects and she defines it as this, a sequence of related events derived from a question, issue, or problem that requires the development of resources and an audience and other participants to result in a product. Um, I think something Snowden said at lunch was that your project's not done, it's actually never done, but it's not really done until you present it, document it, and then present it to someone else. So that'll be like the final thing we talk about today. Okay, so these, are the, these first few slides are lists and then there's no more lists. So just so you know, there's only a few of these. Um, so when you're first scoping out of project, I just want you to get the overview of like what you might run into when you first get into your residencies or, or, a, new, or a new future job. Um, you basically, when you're given a task or you're given a project or you know you're going to start a project, you come up with what exactly has already been produced. Sometimes there's a lot already done, like there's a work plan that you're already having to start with. Um, sometimes there's nothing. Sometimes there's a bunch of emails and you have to like actually create documents that kind of like summarize what are in those emails. Um, and then project timelines are probably the most important thing to relate to the actual scope of work. So you have like a set amount of time to finish something. Sometimes it's ongoing, but usually at some point you're going to have to impose those deadlines because for your own sanity, you can't just kind of set no end deadline for something. You have to be able to set a milestone or, or a point at which you can achieve discernible results in your project. Um, and then milestones are, are actually different from deliverables, but there's milestones which are at this point we want to have completed this, at this point we want to have completed this. Uh, deliverables are an actual product that you have along the way. Like at this point we have a set of authorities, authority records that we're going to deliver. At this point we have an interim report that we have to deliver to the grantor, things like that. So deliverables and milestones, different things. Um, establish your resources, so you have yourself and then you have a team you're working with. So usually it can be two or three people or it can be ten people, and that includes things like IT support and um, you know anybody else in your organization who's going to intersect with your project at all. Just consider that and also their time, availability, and knowledge uh, on the subject matter that they're supposed to be in charge of. And also then you can identify where there's holes where I don't have anyone who knows graphic design but I'm going to need that. Um, and then your reporting structure is important too, so you're gonna have to think through that when you think about your workflow and when you think about your work plan. Say at some point, you know, I'm gonna make a decision, but then that's not necessarily the decision. I certainly learned this at CPB. It could go up 15 levels and then get killed and you have to start over again. So reporting structure is much more important than I think people give it uh, credit for. Uh, roles and responsibilities, obviously. Um, defining those are really important. Sometimes you can just assume that everyone knows their role, and then if you don't, if you don't actually like outline those, people are like doing you know, overlapping work, 
or somebody's doing work that you're doing, so those are the same thing, but you know what I mean. Uh, and the availability of team members, I think I already said that, but the amount of time they actually have to work on the project. So you don't want to go in assuming that like, when you go into a project that somebody's just available for you whenever. Um, they could be going on vacation for two weeks, they could be only available on Mondays. Um, so just got to keep that in mind when you're thinking about everything in the beginning. And then also, your, of course, your material, re material resources, so decks, hardware, computers, the speed of those computers, how much storage you have, when, what external drives you have, whether you have network access, um, things like that, and then obviously software. So um, where will the shared projects live? These are the considerations you have to start thinking through after you kind of scope out what you're working with. Uh, that might seem really obvious to us today in a networked age, but again, you will run into this wherever you go to an, I actually, at my current job, a digital humanities job, I walked in and people were st mostly storing all their project documents on their hard drives of their computers. So one of my first tasks was to gather everything from everyone and I'll put it onto box.com, which is the official UMD shared online collaborative you know, document storage. Um, and I think, in my opinion, you're going to want to have some kind of solution like that and not keep things on local computers, project documents rather. Um, so obviously Google Docs is an, a very obvious choice. Sometimes security uh, concerns of the organizations you're working with won't allow Google Docs, that happens a lot. Um, sometimes they will have a dedicated solution. UMD has box.com, um, which you know the IT department has vetted for security issues. We still sometimes use Google Docs for things we, de we determine have no you know, bearing on sort of security concerns at all. They're just kind of like internal, they're just very basic, you know, planning documents and things like that. But you can make those decisions on your own. Um, and then institutional network storage, like the NAS drive that Joey talked about yesterday, or just servers that are internal are another option. Um, so how will the project team communicate? Obviously email is a big one. Email is not always the best solution, but sometimes it's the quickest and most expedient solution for your needs. It depends on your organization and the level of, um, you've, got peop you've got people sometimes who are just like will not learn a new technology. So if you're very pro Slack, very pro something, um, you're going to run up against someone who's like, no, I'm going to email you and that's how it's going to be. <laughs> um, so you sometimes will have to fight that fight too. And sometimes it's worth it and sometimes it's not. Email will be a large part of how you'll communicate, but then sometimes you can push for these other methods. Um, group messaging, obviously, if you're, especially if you're on the road, if you're at a conference and you all need to meet up at certain points and convene, or if you're at a site doing you know, work in different parts of the vault, group me or, or um, WhatsApp might be great for that. Uh, Slack is a really good option. Now it's usually available for all smartphones. If you haven't seen Slack, I can pull it up so you can, I think m most of you probably know what it is at this point, but it's a group messaging app that can be either on your phone or on your mobile device or on your um, PC or Mac. Um, and then what high level documents will you start with? So oh, I'm gonna talk about these more in depth next, um, but obviously a work plan. You either, you either have a work plan you're starting, to, starting with and then will modify and flesh out, or you're creating one from scratch. Um, a timeline that is actually a, a very integral part of the work plan that is the time in which you have to complete something. And then supporting documents, I'm, I'm concluding as a third bullet because sometimes they just, they have to exist tracking documents for certain things outside of both of those other two things. So we'll go over some of those. Okay, so this is one supporting document. It's just a very high level, uh, you know, just basically a very good suite of Google documents can serve most needs a lot of the time. This example is just a spreadsheet tracking submissions for a symposium that I did as part of this, uh, it's a project about exper post-war experimental film in Los Angeles. So I just tracked everybody as they submitted applications, you know, what their, the subject matter was, and then we used this in meetings to decide who we were gonna invite, easy. Um, and this is a, a very basic starting work plan. Um, so initial sketch of a work plan, it was created for the purposes of writing a grant. Um, this is one's broken down by quarter, but it contains no assigned resources, people. As a basic, uh, basic rule, a work plan starts with a combination of three things. Your timeline, your deliverable, your deliverable products or milestones, and your interim goals. So you need to take this, this initial document and work it into something with a little more teeth. Um, and this is taking it one step further. This is a work plan that I did, a very high level, just using Google Docs work plan with assigned resources broken down by quarter. And then another kind of form you could use as a spreadsheet. This is actually that same work plan that you saw earlier, 
put into spreadsheet form so that you can you know, filter on people and or quarters and hide things, it's a little more malleable. Um, at a more granular level is utilizing an approach of having a shared online database of some kind, which is really useful in environments where either multiple researchers or archivists are working on compiling data or when tracking deliverables and deadlines for multiple projects at once. This is an example of a database that I constructed for that same project, Alternative Projections. And so five researchers were working on entering data about artists, films, and organizations into a FileMaker database. They were working at different times of the day and in different locations around the country. We had them going to different archives and pulling data and entering it. So we had a checkout system where we had the file the database lived on in one folder in Google Docs, and when they were using it, they moved it into another, the checked out folder, um, did their modifications, closed it, and then moved it back into the open folder. And this isn't the greatest solution, but it was the solution we had money to do. So sometimes you're gonna be working in situations where you're like, well, I'd like to have this, this, and this, but this is what I have. Um, so this is what we did. In the end, this, this data was parsed out, and now it, it populates the back end of the website for the final product. Uh, so, in my current position, I work in a department dealing with a whole slate of projects at once at any given time, and you may run into this at various points, if not in this uh, residency, but in the future. Uh, so we've got multiple people overlapping different projects, and their roles flare up and back off sporadically. So in this example, you can see the complexity of you've got multiple projects, people overlap between the projects, and then on this timeline, you have a Gantt chart, and everyone's percentages are listed by month, and then at the, at the bottom, which you can't see, it totals up everybody's percentages to make sure no one ever goes over 100. Um, this is actually a very classic form of project management called resource allocation tracking, and it's the worst experience as a project manager I've ever had because these ideas of percentages are very nebulous and not real. Uh, in real life, the, uh, the percentage model usually fails. Um, it's a good starting point, but the point I'm trying to make is that this is, this is a, this was what led me to realize that we're going to need a more complex solution at the company than using Excel spreadsheets and using percentages. So I'll get into what we ended up with um, at work later. Um, in a similar vein, I'm talking right now about two examples where we had to move past the model of just having like an online database or, or Google Docs to work with. Uh, at the American Archive Project, we were trying to track a very complex set of inventory projects across 100 stations, plus stations, and then subsequent projects related to that project to develop a system uh, for the management of the digitization project. Uh, so the complexity of both of those situations does not lend itself, again, to a very basic suite of documents like online Google Docs. So just to start as one example, this is will look very familiar to Karen. If she, oh, she's not here anymore. Um, she, that's probably why she left. Um, but we developed this access database by taking all the spreadsheets that had been developed at a certain point. When we reached that critical mass of like these spreadsheets are no longer complex enough to serve our needs at CPB, we were also asked to produce reports on progress of the inventories at different points, and that required. No, not flat data about in each individual uh, inventory. So we imported the, the spreadsheet that had been started and then started to link in other aspects of the project so that at any given point we could do a query and produce a report to send off to the executive saying what was going on. It also helped in our meetings with WGBH and then the digital, digitization vendor to pull up those reports and say, okay, WNET uh, has got this going on, but they only need this and they only need to turn in this deliverable and then they'll be done. This person needs a lot of help. Who's going to call them? You know, we would just move down the entire list We'd have categories of active, uh, pending, you know, people who had actually, in the beginning it was all about who had been approved for a grant and who had already been started. So we'd start the project, but like what grants do we need to move into the queue to be approved and what's holding them up? So we would eliminate bottlenecks that way. Um, and so during the inventory phase, we had contractors working with stations on certain aspects of data mapping and compliance. Uh, and that's, that was actually WGBH. And our team at CP, CPB worked with the same team on plans for the nomination of assets for the digitization project. So to track all these components, the access database was uh, stored online in a SharePoint portal. And users and board, it's kind of like the FileMaker model, which again, not ideal, but that's what we had available to us. Our IT department would not allow us to use FileMaker. Uh, so we had to use access. Um, and here's a sustainability 
question for you. If you have something, this was the thing that Karen will recognize that we ran up against. They would only let us use Microsoft Access. It was the kind of environment where they wouldn't even allow us to install anything new without the IT department's knowledge. So, and this is something you will run up against, so just be prepared. Um, if you're not able to, you're gonna have to work with what you, what you have. Access is a very powerful tool, but also this project ended up at WGBH, and WGBH used Macintosh, so they can't use Access. So um, always keep in mind like the longevity of your product or your project and what will be accessible later. So in this view, this is the same database still. Um, I tracked a separate project for the planning of the digitization process. I just wanted to show you different skins of this and the different uses of it. So this was just tracking different stations' nominations of their their own material and what progress they were making at different points. Um, in the end, the database was transformed into a tool that, um, for the, that informed the future growth of the archive, or it was supposed to. Um, again, the Microsoft Access problem became an issue for that, but we actually added in all data from all possible media stations into the database so that it was all linked and you had a categorization system of someone who had participated in the inventory, someone who applied but wasn't funded for the inventory, someone who didn't apply at all, and then you also had it broken down by stations and non-stations. So this was our own kind of taxonomy we created to be able to sort these, um, but yeah, the creation of taxonomies for project management is pretty underrated as part of it, I think. So um, yet another level past the use of more complex collaborative documents like databases is the use of actual project management software and tools, um, which I've been doing now um, actually since the middle of the, pr the, the uh, archival management. So the archival management system was created during the middle of my American Archive tenure, and it started with, starting with that and up to now, I've only ever used project management software. So I'm gonna go over three of them, um, some we may be familiar with and some not. Uh, Basecamp, Jira, and Trello. Basecamp is a uh, very ubiquitous um, project management suite of tools that is all hosted online with a subscription fee, and it is based on uh, what we call a waterfall approach to project management. The, uh, the, the milestones and the, uh, the deadlines are set, and they're supposed to be rigid, and it usually is based on some kind of contractual ob obligation, which is frequent, especially with things like grants, but also if you're a vendor doing a project for someone else. Basecamp doesn't need to utilize a waterfall approach, but it ends up usually, just because of its functionality, ends up being a very good, very flexible, very malleable tool for doing basic projects or, or project management that utilizes the waterfall technique where you're sort of like, I have a deadline, I have to deliver by that deadline, it has to be like this. Um, so again, Basecamp is pretty ubiquitous. Um, that is what the, the interface looks like when it's live. Um, because it's a subscription model, just take into account, this is a sustainability question again, if, you, if your organization st decides to stop using Basecamp at a certain point, you will be able to download and archive uh, as XML documents all of your former Basecamp files, or sorry, HTML documents, all your former Basecamp files and look at them on a computer, but it's all very manual, so it's not gonna look like this and all pretty. And actually, the follow, I'm saying this because the following four examples I'll show you are archived HTML versions of this site. So um, they don't usually look this basic, but I wanted to actually show you like real examples of how Basecamp is used. So um, Basecamp uses a suite of tools that function together cohesively, so you have a documents interface, a discussion, like you have discussion boards, to-do lists, events, people, and a calendar view. Um, so it's very effective actually when you have multiple projects going on at once because the calendar view allows you to see how those projects overlap and you know you have little bubbles that show all the resources or people that are assigned to each project and you can see when you you have four, you know, like four overlapping Gantt lines and different colors with the same person on all of them that you're in trouble there because that person's probably overloaded during that period of time. So it's effective for that. Um, so you can see here just kind of like one interface has current to-do lists and completed to-do lists. Um, so going back, this is a document. And so this is going back to the initial kind of milestone phase level work plan document that we saw before. Oh, this time it's in Basecamp. So this was created as a document um, and then I sent it out to the team and I said comment on this and we'll tweak it 
until it's correct. So I sent it out to the developers and to my boss, and we looked over everything and, and tweaked it so it stayed a static document with edits. And you can actually go back, track like, like Google Docs, go back and track the edits that you made. So if you realize something that you changed needed to go back or you wanted to look back, you can just look back at different versions of that document. So once we created our, our work plan in basic document form like this, you were ready for the next plays, phase, which was planning. And so to get to the next step, you're, you're gonna be breaking down your milestones into individual tasks and then assigning uh, people to those tasks. And most of the time, you'll typically be able, need to be able to quantify how those tasks and their subparts, how long they will take. Um, we always know that those estimates are, are just that, estimates, but then if you don't do some kind of estimate, it becomes really difficult to have an idea of how to, how many things, for example, to put in a particular three-month phase. Um, so you start out with this, and what happens usually is this is never a set process. Even though this is waterfall and that makes it more set, you will always be able to go back at some point, or you will have to go back and say, like, okay, we put way too many things in phase three. This is gonna take way, way longer than we, we've scoped out, so you either extend phase three or you can move things into different phases to accommodate for what the reality is becoming over time. Okay, so moving on to what is Agile and how is it different from what I've been talking about. Um, it's, again, increasingly becoming the standard framework or philosophy uh, for managing projects generally. Um, it's likely you'll probably encounter Agile more and more as you go into your careers. Uh, a basic synopsis of it is it allows for flexibility on projects where that flexibility is needed, um, as opposed to the tra traditional waterfall techniques. There's not a finite set of goals and a rigid su succession of deadlines. There's usually some kind of end deadline, but then ev every bit of work in between it uh, the acknowledgement is that all of that work is flexible so that you can actually adjust it as you need. As you go and you find out something's happening quicker than you thought or taking longer than you thought, you can adjust your goals and you can adjust your, your contracts essential, um, to match those. So your plan actually is shifting all the time. And the way that happens in, um, in the Scrum method, which I will talk about first, is that you start off with, okay, so sorry, just to go back. The basics are there is something called usually a, a backlog of all the things that have to happen overall in the project, usually not started with, talk, with talking about any deadlines or timelines, just all things that have to happen, usually ordered by priority. And then what happens is you decide on a set amount of time for your sprint. Sometimes it's two weeks, sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's three weeks, it depends. Um, and you have every, those every two weeks you have a sprint planning meeting where certain items are moved into the backlog, I'm sorry, are moved into the sprint. And then in that, basically in that sprint planning meeting you break down all of those into ta more granular tasks, define what makes them done. And then they get assigned a number which is like, the number, like you decide that my development team can accomplish up to 25 points in this two week phase, because that's our kind of like max. And so then as you go through each task, you're like, is this a two point task? Is this a five point task? And when you add up all the tasks, you sometimes realize I've got too many tasks in here. I don't have enough tasks in here. And you build your sprint based on your, your team's capacity and then try and accomplish everything in that sprint within that, that time period. And then past Scrum, there's Kanban. So Kanban is what we are now using at Myth, and I'll get into specific examples of it later, but it's, it's a, it's actually takes the Scrum process and makes it more flexible. So you have, you know, instead of having time boxed uh, prescribed weeks, you have, you know, that is actually optional. You can do two week sprints, or you can kind of make it an ongoing flexible process. And usually, like the model is that you just have a in the queue, going on now and done column and that that is always moving back and forth. And you don't even have, you can have meetings to discuss what's going on and why things are moving or you can choose not to. Um, and the main thing about Kanban is that it eliminates bottlenecks because in sprints, you're so, you're so focused on the rigid idea, it's still a little rigid of getting the things in that sprint done that when you come across a bottleneck and that thing causes everything else in a sprint to uh, get pushed, then everything suffers. So the real thing that you should do is move the thing that's causing the bottleneck back into the backlog and continue on the things that can go, uh, keep going, and then sort of like move that thing back when the problem that's causing the bottleneck has been addressed. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to give very specific examples of one piece of software that utilizes Scrum. Um, and again, 
I don't know if any of you will ever use Scrum this intensely. This was a software development project with a co major government contract and a very high amount of money. So actually it was AV Preserve that we were working with on this to develop the archival management system. And they suggested using Scrum, actually flew me up and we all took Scrum training together. So I was technically what was called the product owner, which means I was the client for whom um, each individual task, I was being demonstrated that each thing was done and I said this is good or this is not good, this is done, this is not done. And then on at ABPS, they had something called a scrum master, which is like the project manager on site who then led the developers and actually made sure that everything within that sprint was done. So again, um, the idea with Scrum starts with the product backlog. All project needs are tracked there. The way the needs are tracked is, un is a little bit unique in that the way they're, they're, they're concretely stating the scope of the task in a way that's framed as a story. So the need is articulated in terms of the end goal. So each user story is fleshed out in advance to the extent possible. And it's something called acceptance criteria is defined. So that was what I was talking about with like what makes this task done. Um, the, project, the product owner, like I said, decides the order of relevance of the stories in the backlog. Um, so in this one you can see, as an administrator, I need to be able to track, report, track and report digitized and scheduled assets by format type in order to report to stakeholders and to plan for future preservation efforts. And then we define the acceptance criteria below. Um, we assigned it uh, a number and then basically broke it down into subtasks and then this was moved into the sprint. And sometimes you, in these planning meetings, you will discover that something is scoped out too large and that it, by itself it would take up the whole sprint and decide that what's more logical is to actually break this into two separate cards or three separate cards that makes it a more discernible, or sorry, a, a more completable task within that sprint. I think this is just another view of the same kind of idea. This is the backlog. So on my screen, it's like super tiny. Uh, but you can see some of the, the, some of the product stories on here. And each thing is given a number. And then you have a set number that your team can accomplish within the sprint. So um, again, at intervals every two weeks, we have this sprint planning meeting. This is, just an, and this is just actually another view of everything. It's just an overview of like we had, it was all held virtually, um, video conferencing. Our, the development team was actually in India, and then we had ABPS up there. It's Kara and Nick Bardwaj, and then me at CPB. Um, and on the right, we were making notes, typing in the acceptance criteria, and kind of working through. And this is, this is, these are all, this is the JIRA interface. This is what it, it's supposed to do and what it's designed for. And so at the end of the two weeks, there's something called a demonstration and a retrospective. So it's the demonstration of that sprint's work. And so each story is are, are demonstrated to have worked. And then I either mark, we either mark them complete or send them back into the product backlog for further tweaking. Um, or we decide that the things that need to be adjusted on it are, are actually a new task and create a new task and, and indicate that on the notes. Um, the process is good because it allows for a, a learning curve. Uh, in the beginning sprints, team members start to learn what methods work and what, what doesn't, how granular the task descriptions need to be, and be realistic for how they can be accomplished. Okay, so again, I'm getting back to Kanban now. Um, so again, we have a slate of projects that is a lot of projects that are happening at the same time. And in the beginning, I was asked when I came in to do something that allows you to, to give you that very strict, like in March, Raffaele will have 95% of his time taken up. And over time, we just realized that this was not only taxing my sanity to have to do math 20 to six hours a day every day, um, but math that was ostensibly not based in reality because in reality people don't work in percentages. Um, things take longer or take less time than, than usually any, any estimate of a percentage that you put into a grant is really going to end up being in reality. So after about a year of trying to, in bits and starts, implement some kind of agile uh, framework, we ended up with uh, going with a little bit of a hybrid of Kanban and Scrum. So even though we were using Kanban, um, using the software Trello, which I'll go into in a minute, uh, we were actually, we were having sprint meetings. So we are, every two weeks we have, on Monday, we have a sprint meeting in which we go over everything that was done in the last week, everything that wasn't done, and then basically move that into its own list, archive that, and then work on getting what's in the product backlog back into the like current, current week tasks list. 
So you can see on this, on this example, a scrum is like first day of the sprint, and then the mid sprint starts, stuff starts to move, and then the idea is by the last day, everything's on the right. In Kanban, it's like basically constantly shifting. So even though we have meetings every two weeks, it's like during the middle of that two weeks, I can have four tasks added because like, I didn't realize that something needed to be happening uh, in that sprint during the meeting, but then they came up, so then I would move things that were in the sprint that I'm now not gonna be able to get done back into the backlog, and then just make notes. You can always make notes in Trello, like I moved this back because of X kind of thing. So Kanban's very flexible, it's ongoing, and it's iterative. iterative. So what we have is, this is the Trello interface, which you'll see more examples of later. Has anybody ever worked with Trello? I feel like a couple of you mentioned it at certain points, okay. So Trello is actually a very malleable interface. It's free, um, there is a pro version. We're using the free version at work and we're using it a lot. So I think the free version actually covers a lot of functionality. Um, so what, the way we do it is we have a backlog and the, the way it's set up is that there are lists that you can make whatever you want. And the lists have a series of cards within them. So the way we've done it is that we have lists for each project for all possible tasks related to that project and there are color codes for the projects and then you add people to each task. Um, and then from the backlog, right before the first, uh, the first day of the first sprint, right before the planning meeting, everybody who's responsible for a particular project or task moves their cards into the proposed for next sprint column of the main project management Trello board. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's basically, that should be anything that you think needs to happen in the following sprint. Mm -hmm. And then, in the, like I said, in the project meeting, or in the project, um, or in the sprint planning meeting, we will first go over everything that's in the done column from top to bottom. I will open each card and I will say like, what you know, what happened with this. I'll usually type a quick note in there, and then I'll move it into its own list that says like sprint 20 date to date. Um, move everything over, and then we'll go through current sprint. Make sure there's nothing in there that should have been moved to done, and if it wasn't done, move it back to the project or the proposed for next sprint. And then basically you have two clean, like empty uh, lists on the right. Archive the Sprint 20 list as one list and then it just goes into the archive. And then you start going through the proposed for next sprint person by person and moving it into current sprint and then you start over. People really like this. It's a really, really good tool. It's been working really nice for us. Um, there's no like percentage talk. <laughs> at, 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 a, at a basic level, it's still me that has to have a sort of like high level idea of the project's overall timeline and whether we're meeting those goals. So I'm still responsible for that, but I'm not imposing that on other people by saying like, did you do 10% work this week? which is just something that will just make your developers angry at you. If you just keep going to them and saying, did you do this amount of work every week, they just start to hate you. Um, and I started to get like to the point where I was just like, I cannot do the, the percentages anymore. <laughs> like You need to like let me do something that's like based in reality. Okay, so this is um, what a card looks like. At the top is the description of the task. You have uh, underneath is the um, list it's in. And if it has a, you actually add more than one, you can add up to 10 or you can add all the labels if you want, if it's in different categories. Um, you have a due date, if you, if you need a due date, for example, you can just put the end of the sprint as the due date or you, if it's due in the middle of the sprint, like if it's due by a specific day, you can add it there. Um, you can add attachments from either box.com, Dropbox, your computer, your local computer, or Google Docs as attachments there, and then you can add a checklist. So the checklist, as you go throughout the sprint, will you will be able to go through and check stuff off. And it'll show as like a percentage of the task that's done. Um, so you notice that in this instance here, you can see the tracker for the digital dialogue series, which is the speaker series that I run at work, is linked to on the card. So that's what I was saying earlier, that even though you have these project management um, tools that you use, you probably still will need separate supporting documents just to track kind of like static things. Like I have tracked all the digital dialogue speakers we have coming, what's their affiliation, what's their Twitter handle, all the things that will eventually need to populate their website pages. So after we get to the point where these are all moved onto the WordPress site, I will kind of like retire this and archive it as well. So the, this is for the activity pane. I just did a, a view where you can see the activity pane. It's very much, uh, to most of you, this is probably pretty intuitive, but the activity pane is just basically, as you go, you can comment on that particular task and say, for example, like, I don't, I don't know what this means, can someone clarify it for me and, and tag that person? Or you can type notes or paste in emails, like I received this email from the Internet Archive saying we need this many things for the collection, how many do we have? 
Um, and then, you know, at the end, uh, usually there's like a summary card at the very top. I'll usually type those in the meeting. So I'll pull open the card and I'll say like, what happened with this? And I'll type a quick note saying this was da 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 completed. And it makes for, I think that I want to stress in this that um, never think that this is too much. Like typing notes and actually like making notes in some kind of organized format during your project it can almost never be too much because later there will be a point, this has happened to me on multiple occasions, where someone asks you a question about why something is set up a certain way and it was two years ago and you have no recollection of why that decision was made. But you know, you know that it was made for, you, you know it was discussed at a meeting, you know it was made for a very particular reason but you don't remember why. The more notes you make, the more you can go back and be like, oh, we decided on that because the S3 server had been experiencing instability and so we moved to this to, you know, counteract that, or like, or the IT department told me told us we couldn't, so we didn't go with that solution. Like, basically, if you document all of that in some form, um, in this case, we do it on the activity pane. Then later, when a question's asked, or if you're trying to remember why something was done a certain way, you can go back and reference it. Um, and if you notice here, share and more, it's kind of light, but it's up below archive. There's a share and more button. It just has a link, a very tiny uh, URL to that specific card. And you can either, you can actually like in future sprints, if you want to reference back to this card, just include that link and it actually like immediately transforms into the name of the card when you paste it into a new Trello card. This is something I used for our, uh, for when I, I used a wiki, I used PB Works to do all project management at one of my former jobs. I just think it's funny now to look back at this. Um, so it is a similar project or a similar similar concept um, to I guess Basecamp, but you be, I, it's, it's all manual. Like you have to create the links manually. You have to create the sort of like guides to what you know needs to happen manually. I had a front page with like use instructions, um, basic. Um, information about the board, and then an actions and priorities list, and then like administ and this is just me making something work for what I needed it, like making a tool work for what I needed it, and so you can do that too. Um, as long as you can figure out if the tool's comfortable for you and people buy into it, um, make it work, like Tim Gunn says. Okay, so um, what I wanna do is do the exercise, but I would like to hear you guys look at this think through some of the concepts that we've talked about today and come up with a plan for how you would manage it. And so just to be clear, I'm not asking you to come up with uh, like a specific workflow or come up with technical solutions. I'm asking you to project manage this as like a very like high level first step of like how would you, what tools would you use? Um, but anyway, we're gonna start with what the, the background is. Um, it started off because Myth did this, um, this stewardship of digital humanities collections blog post series where we had revamped our entire website. I had gone through all of the projects, cleaned up all the data, pulled in data from older projects that weren't on the site anymore, and we'd done this big overhaul of the research interface with faceted browse and search. And when we did that, everything became much more transparent and searchable, and people were, draw were driven to the site to research our former projects and, and look at them. So what we realized was that we had this ongoing series since 2005, the digital dialogues, which were now much more visible. And we've been recording them for a long time, and, but we had sort of like, some of them were just on an S3 server, some of them were on, I mean, they're, they're on the Internet Archive, they're in different places. Um, we wanted that to be a very clean process so that when people did come to the site, they were like, oh, I can click through and look, look at this as a collection. Um, you know, click through everything and see it on Vimeo. And on the back end, I, I wanted to make sure that we had everything in one place. So just to walk through really quickly, um, we had we've had 193 um, events total, 129 were recorded on some format, 78 of those on video of various formats, 51 of them on audio only. Access copies for the video and audio are, are in a combination of Vimeo, which we've been using for about three years, the Internet Archive, or sitting on an, an Amazon S3 server, and the WordPress site that we use uh, would just link to those as a download, so you couldn't even stream them. You could just download the entire thing and listen to it on your local drive. Um, this was like one of the earliest iterations of this uh, before there was really YouTube or anything it was ubiquitous. Um, so the source and project files were in various locations. Some of them were on the internal drive for the iMac that we use for our video editing station. Some were on an external drive. Some were duplicated between those two. And then there was a separate local server, a separate one from the S3 server where other files lived. So they were in different places and they were different formats. Um, I, for a while before I got there, they were using iMovie. 
um, which I'm, I'm looking for reactions, but like it's just like a terrible idea. Um, it creates these massive files which are very unstable and don't uh, you know, always yield results. I mean, they just basically create them like a massive project file, like 16 gigabyte mass like project file for something that should be like, you know. Anyway, um, so again, this is what you have to work with. You have a project manager, which is you. You're there full time, but you've got a bunch of other priorities you're working with at the same time. You've got a graphic or web designer who's there half time, who's in the office one day a week, but then re works remotely as needed the other 12 hours of the week. You've got one lead developer who's there to advise on anything related to servers, at server access, or anything like that, um, who is full-time but juggling other projects as well. And then you're gonna have one iSchool intern for six weeks at half-time, 20 hours a week, to do this project. Um, so for tools and software, you have access to Google Docs, you have Box.com, you have Microsoft Suite, obviously, and you have a Creative Suite on all the computers at UMD have Adobe Creative Suite. Uh, we have been using for the last two years as background Adobe Premiere to edit all of our videos. So that's the current method. Um, and you have Trello. And uh, as a side note, we weren't able to bring, or we, we cannot bring the intern into our Trello board. So if Trello, if you opt to use Trello, which you would not have to, um, it would have to be its own separate new board. Couldn't be like migrate, it couldn't be worked into the current Myth project management board. Um, because there's stuff in there that we wouldn't like necessarily need to give him, want to give him access to, or her. It was a him. But. Um, and then your video editing station is an iMac. You have an external Western digital hard drive and access to two different servers where certain other files are stored now or could be stored again. Um, and then a myth site hosted in WordPress where uh, at the point of this project is the only place where all the data for all the digital archive or the digital dialogues live in one place ever. Because at various points, things were tracked separately in documents. After they were moved to WordPress, those documents were retired. Um, and only since I've been there, I think, were those documents retained. So you just have WordPress to uh, work with to get basic data out for all the digital dialogues that have ever been created. Um, so the goals of the project are to move all the source files, access copies, and project files into one location, organize them all into a coherent and cohesive file directory structure, normalize for formats where possible and appropriate, uh, determine a plan for redundant storage of all the files, determine a plan for the long-term preservation of the collection, create a workflow for future event recording, editing, and archiving, preservation, and then you're going to write two blog posts, one at three weeks and one at six weeks, detailing your process and, and highlights from the collection that you liked. So those are the goals. Um, and so your instructions for this are to, we're asking you what documents are needed for this project, you know, how are you going to construct your work plan, your timeline, your support, what supporting documents do you need? How do you structure these documents? Uh, what basic information, like what are the skeletal format forms of these documents and what information do you need from them? Uh, and what are the tools and technologies you need for this project? Do you need Google Docs? What do you need? Online collaborative documents, project management tools, um, what are you going to use? Um, so I actually think that you guys should gather into like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, like going down like you three, um, maybe Snowden and Casey and Rachel and you three, and then you, uh, Andrew, Lorena, and Selena. Does that make sense? So groups of three. And I'll give you about 15 minutes. Is that long enough? And then we'll talk about, I, I'd like everybody at the end, they've asked me to make it so that when you guys talk, it's, you can see what you're doing. So one representative from each group come up to the front and actually talk about what you decided. We decided that um, for this team that's relatively small, we weren't necessarily needing Trello and would manage the project with Google online documents, especially with um, the privacy concerns with the intern and also our half-time staff member who's in and out of the office. It also has um, collaborative and
synchronous, asynchronous communication. So um, the different things in a project where you need to communicate and store documents, it's all in there. Um, we would write some work plans so that everybody's on the same page, has um, assigned tasks or roles, define those. Timeline, um, not necessarily. We, we decided we don't need to follow a strict timeline since it wasn't really set, but we did, six. oh sorry, six weeks. So it's six weeks for the timeline, but also to sketch out what parts and what steps of the plan needed to be done before one another in case they were to create um, bottlenecks and also how long they might take. Um, we also decided to create a living workflow so that as we went along, in the beginning, what the workflow looked like might change, and that would inform the other parts of the goals and outcomes. Um, what basic information is needed to get started? The content is um, from the website is a big one. Um, the inventory, which is part of our process, informs a lot of the outcomes. Um, no schedules, you know, so we all communicate. Um, Maybe if uh, we would collaborate more and ask the developer or other people for the plan of preservation if we needed more information on storage, like details, to make sure that our current existing storage were up to long-term preservation um, minimums, because you know storage is not the same all across the board. Tools and technologies, the Google stuff. Um, we do spreadsheets for inventory as a kind of basic applications that you would think of. If you have questions, you can always ask, but we didn't go very detailed into that. Um, we also decided that we would use the intern a lot. <laughs> the intern would do a lot of these tasks, including the blog. Um, so they would have the online access and the, the uh, password for that. Um, the project manager would probably be the one um, designing and writing a script that the intern could run as well as the procedures for that so that intern could follow and also reviewing the work. Um, and all that back and forth is just basic communication. So I think we are looking at it from a more simple lens, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. One quick note on the security issues with Trello, just in case anybody else was stuck on that. Um, you're only able to see a board if you're invited to it. So as long as you have a Trello account, I could create an account with any one of you to manage a project with just the two of you. And it would still be the same Trello account I use for Myth, but you'd don't you only be able to see our board and not Myth. So if I was unclear on that, I just wanted to be clear. Okay, um, next group. We decided um, that the first thing you kind of want to do is kind of do a quick and dirty inventory. So you could just do that in a spreadsheet or a Google Doc. Um, if you wanted to move to Trello, you said there were imports available, so that option is still open to us, but ultimately we decided um, that you want to know where everything is, and then you want to talk to your uh, web designer and your lead developer and kind of come up with a plan with them, uh, kind of in partnership, before you even want to bring the intern on. Um, we also thought for documentation you would probably want a timeline, especially if you're bringing in an intern. You want to be as specific as possible with uh, their goals and what you want them to bring the ta to the table. Um, and you might want to create a manual for them, and that could be part of your documentation at the end as well. Um, and also, with that inventory, you could start thinking about controlled vocabularies that you want to uh, use to normalize all of your metadata. Uh, what else? Um, oh, and for the blog posts, you could have the intern also contribute to that, so they get their name on the web page, and then um, you can include all that in the final report at the end. So that's kind of what we came up with in just a few minutes. Again, very fast and simple. I'll give you guys a quick overview of what we did end up doing uh, after this, but just as a note, we did end up having several meetings with um, the project manager, the developer, and the designer to decide on a, a start of a direction before the intern came on. So she was in line with what we did for that. Um, you guys next? We thought we you know, looked at the team to begin with and realized that we really don't have a lot of time to be uh, spending our staff resources on this project. Uh, we also looked at the project goals and outcomes and realized 
uh, or wondered if there was even a, really a need for a graphic or web designer. Um, but in the end, we decided that uh, what the project manager would begin the project by doing is developing a plan and a workflow based on their past experience of managing these types of projects, then have a couple of meetings with the lead developer to make sure that they were on the same page and assign some tasks to the developer, including writing a few scripts that could uh, make this work happen automatically instead of having it to be a more manual process, um, and then incorporating those scripts into the work flow and then bringing on an intern, training them for about a week and then having them uh, just follow the work plan that has been established using the scripts and using the uh, instructions that we've already provided and you know we thought that that could be accomplished pretty efficiently. Um, uh, and then, you know, developing based on what is, is happening throughout the course of the project, you know, meeting, you know, with the developer, continuing to meet with the, with the developer um, and the intern to, uh, to assess and monitor the success of the project. And um, in that time, with the developer, determine a plan for the uh, redundant storage and uh, the long-term preservation of the collection. But, that, but the long-term preservation of the collection should also be based on your, uh, your general digital preservation policies and procedures for the organization at large. So that should have already been established. Uh, but and then writing, we ha would have the intern write the two blog posts because he or she would have been the most invested in the project over the course of the timeline. And also it would give him or her the opportunity to get their name out and talk about their work. Our, our first action or idea was to, um, our first phase of the plan was um, going to be pre-intern to try and get um, everybody on the same page and determine what needed to be done so that by, when the intern came in, um, he or she could hit the ground running. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the tasks that we identified for that phase would be a list or inventory of videos that needed to be migrated or uploaded to the site. Um, we were also talking about using Google Docs because most of the um, documents that we we're talking about making would either be calendars or spreadsheets. Um, uh, we were talking about creating a schedule uh, of access to the video editing station in case other people also needed to use that. Um, scheduling meetings between the whole team, developer, designer, and maybe the intern. Um, uh, we haven't decided the other milestones in terms of when they would be, but um, that would be another thing that would be in those schedules. Um, and we talked about not necessarily assigning specific tasks within those milestones to specific team members right off the bat, um, just sort of determining we want this at this phase of the project and we want these at this phase of the project and as we roll along, um, divvying those out as we went. So I'm going to quickly do this quickly, just briefly go over what we did end up doing. Like most of you said, we did have several meetings for um, the team to decide on, uh, first of all, to determine the state of where everything was. And for that, we actually had Kirsten, our, our graphic designer, download and uh, export everything as a CSV that was on the site for Digital Dialog. So that started off the process with a spreadsheet, an online spreadsheet. So we did start with a Google Doc. Um, that then uh, populated, so this is just the basic metadata downloaded from uh, WordPress to start with. And then over here you have, I don't know why this is so wide, but we have all these uh, files talking about where the storage is for everything and what the state, is, the state of everything is. From there we were able to quantify, we have this many that need to be moved off of the S3 server, we have this many that need to be moved here. We've decided on Vimeo as our main access platform. We decided that everything needs to have a title slate, even though that's, that process started later in the game. So earlier videos that did not have a title slate would need to be re-exported with one, including audio, which would be laid over one title slate that would play the whole time. So then everything would be on Vimeo, which is then organized by season in groups. And so to get actually started 
actually, he loved Trello, so he fit right in with everybody else. Uh, we, did do, we did use Trello, and we used uh, a Kanban approach. We did it a little bit differently than we do at Myth, in that we had uh, week one, week two, week three, you know, all six weeks laid out, started with everything on the backlog, and then moved whatever we were working in for that week into current, into current week. Um, documents like the one we were talking about were linked to from cards. So this was only for task management, and then final products were all delivered elsewhere. Um, the blog posts that he created were linked to from here. We made edits um, on, you know, as comments in the Google Docs, but then when we were done, we would comment on Trello saying, this is done, Trevor, are you writing off on it? Yes, I'm gonna put it up on the site, that kind of thing. Um, and then, um, what was the final thing I was gonna say? Oh, workflow, then he created a workflow, which then I ended up reviewing, editing, modifying, um, and that was the final product of it. And I'm not gonna open it because I haven't actually, it's pretty new and I don't wanna look at it if it's real all wonky and embarrass him. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to end on that note that your final product is, um, for in this case, it was the two blog posts detailing his work and highlights from the collection, and then also uh, the workflow that now we are going to be utilizing for recording new events and integrating it into uh, a workflow that allows us to create redundant storage and edit it, you know, how we edit things. He also created, by the way, Adobe Premiere files for all past projects, organized it beautifully into a lovely file directory structure, duplicated that into several locations, or two locations, uh, one server and one hard spinning disk. Um, and then basically now we have a workflow and a digital preservation policy for AV materials, which was our first one. Um, at the end of this, it was a very successful six week project and we are asking him to come back next, se next semester and be the one who records and edits our digital dialogues to see if his workflow works in real life. And then if it actually like, needs tweaking, he can do that tweaking himself. Um, if he doesn't have a class conflict, he will. And so yeah, um, final products are workflows. I have a couple up here. This is just one I did for the ARL. Um, these are, these were covered in the workflow presentation, but just, it, 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 you'll end up with something and a workflow is a very, very, typical end scenario for an archival digital management project. So you'll either have a workflow, you'll have blog posts, um, you'll have this nice pretty spreadsheet tracking all the, the assets and what happened to them and what state they're in. You have a Trello board that's, com that's marked as completed um, to show if anybody ever has a question about why a decision was made. And then you will have, in this other case, this is not for this project, but just for me, when we, did, when we revised our processes for Trello, I created a revised management processes document, um, doc, like went through the whole process, linked out to what different things looked like, um, described calendar views, filtering cards, it's basically a how-to document, so that if I ever leave for another position, the next project manager can come in and say, oh, this is what they're doing and why. So if, if, if my project, so to speak, was coming in and creating a project management process at Myth, this was my product. Um, and since projects are never finished, I'm sure this will be modified and, and amended over time too. So anyway, that's what I got. Thank you guys for participating. I saw a demo of it and the guy was saying that one of his big surprises after they'd got it built was just how strong you had to be um, to do computing. You're moving, you know, essentially like several hundred gears to, you know, divide seven by three, right? Um, the whole thing kind of uh, clicks through.